All right. Uh, so, uh, hello, everyone. Um, welcome to today's uh, HKU program deep dive session on business and economics. Uh, my name is Nicole. I'm a student recruitment counselor from HKU, and I'll be moderating the session today. So, um, uh, I'd like to quickly uh, walk you through today's rundown. So uh, today we have two presentations, and uh, after each presentation, uh, there will be a short Q&A for you to ask any questions that you have for the programs. And uh, uh, you can uh, talk to the speaker directly. We will either invite you to raise hand to speak up, or uh, you can type your questions in the chat box. Okay, so uh, after the two presentations, if you still have any you know, questions on general application, you're welcome to stay behind and talk to me. Uh, uh, we will try, your, try our best to answer your questions. All right, so uh, before we begin, I'd like to show you a message from our uh, Vice President and Pro Vice Chancellor, Professor Ian Holliday. Hello, I'm Ian Holliday. I'm happy to welcome you to Hong Kong U. Uh, we're already looking ahead to the first semester of next academic year and what we're going to be doing for teaching and learning when you join us. We know that this summer we can return to face-to-face -face teaching on campus and that will be something of a trial run for the main semester, semester one, from September through to December. We're confident then that we can also do a lot of face-to-face -face teaching on campus. Of course, there'll be some hybrid teaching. Some of our teaching will stay online because our students and our teachers have been very happy with some of the online teaching that they've had from us in, in the last few months. So we'll keep those best bits, but we will also bring you all on campus. There will be face-to-face -face teaching and you will get a great educational experience here at Hong Kong U. So I'm looking forward to seeing you in September, to welcoming you, you to the campus and to joining you as we reinvent our campus in the new semester. Okay, so uh, now uh, I'd like to uh, give uh, the presentation time to Professor Anna Wong, uh, who is now the Program Director of the Assets Management and Private Banking Program. So, Professor Wong, please. Uh, dear prospective students of the university, um, welcome to this Zoom session, and we, we look forward, or I look forward to sharing with you um, uh, some of the programs at Hong Kong U and specifically the program that I manage, which I think all of you are interested in understanding what is asset management and private banking. Um, I would not be, I would not be uh, doing any slide presentation, but I would rather use a free format uh, to discuss with you uh, the asset management and private banking program. So a lot of hard data I think you can find from the our website. So I would be talking about hopefully things that is not so hard data wise. Um, you see on the first page here, I mean, I just have a very quick introduction of myself. So you see my title is actually called Professor of Practice in Finance. Uh, personally, um, I've only been teaching for the last four years or three years. I work in the finance industry, specifically in asset management and private banking for the last 30 years. So a uniqueness of this program, which I would elaborate a little bit more as I go through the program, it's the practical element that myself and a lot of the uh, industry practitioners and the young professors that could bring in into the program to prepare you to understand more about the real side or practical side of the industry. So this is my brief introduction and I'm the program director for asset management and private banking, a program that was started in the university just three years ago. Um, before I deep dive into this program, I just uh, have a quick snapshot of the nine programs managed by the Faculty of Business Economics and at a very, very high level, the high level difference and you can think about which program fits you more in terms of your character, interest, quant ability, people skill ability. So this is, um, uh, 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 I will go through very quickly in one by one. And then understand after my session, um, 
there will be another speaker to talk to you on one of the other programs. So if you look at this quick snapshot, um, Faculty of Business and Economics, we ran nine programs. The programs difference by the degree of quantitative uh, analysis, and that's where possibly you look at your own interest. When I say quantitative and qualitative, I would have one spectrum of very quant, people who just like to work on the computer, to work on spreadsheets, to work on files, and on the other spectrum, people who just knows how to talk brilliantly. Okay, so if I could use this spectrum, so I would say quantitative skill and people skill. People skills means how you deal with people, how you talk, how you attract people's um, engagement attention. While I use this spectrum, in the real world, there's no, just one side of the spectrum. All the jobs must be somewhere in between. But of course, it depends on whether you are leaning on the quant side or leaning on the people skill side. Um, personally, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not a quant person. Okay, I talk more and then my skill is more uh, delivering speeches, talking, selling and marketing. But I would still need a lot of quantitative analysis. For example, if I am selling you a mobile phone, Okay, so I'm attracting you to buy my mobile phone. So I'm, de I'm designing actually marketing program, promotion program on, of, the, of the mobile phone. I need to know how a mobile phone works. That's the quant side. Okay, I need to know the specifics of the iPhone. So there's no job with at the end of each spectrum, but everywhere is in the middle. And these nine programs have different ways where you park into a particular spectrum. I will go into one by one very quickly before I deep dive into EMPB. So I would start with the, the programs where, uh, where we demand less quantitative skills, more the people skills and the qualitative analysis and the logic analysis, more than a quant. So these are the three, actually we have five, which is less quant. So the first one, which is a less quant, Okay, of course, as I mentioned, there's nothing called no quantitative. Everywhere there's quantitative analysis. So we have a BBA, a BBA degree, and within the BBA, we have five specialization. And understand after my session, you'll be, you'll be having a session on entrepreneurship, design, and innovation. So within this BBA, uh, you, you pick one of the five majors. And obviously, things like human resources and marketing are the less quant. And where, where you come in design and innovation, a bit of more quant. So this is the BBA, which is generally, I said, the less quant. And the second degree that we host is BBA Accounting and Finance. This is for any student who wants to be an accountant. So this is an, a, 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 a program or a degree accredited by the uh, accounting professional uh, qualification. And third, we have the IBGM. Um, international business and global management, which is more, uh, as the name mentioned, more catered to global exposure with uh, uh, international courses as well. So these three and the other two coming are the less one. Um, the BBAIS, this is more the, on the information system. And the fifth one is the BBA law. Okay. A lot of students have not decided whether they like to be lawyer or they like to be in the finance or in the business. So if you are still struggling between these two uh, career paths, this is a degree that would fit you. So you decide whether you want to be a lawyer after the fourth year. So this is BBA Law and, and uh, LLB. Okay. So these are the five programs in, the, in, in um, faculty, which is required a little bit less quant. And the three courses, which require more quantitative analysis, technical skill analysis, financial analysis, would be the BEcon, BEcon in finance, and the AMPB that I'll be talking in more detail. And of course, the last degree is quantitative finance. So quant finance is the most demanding on quantitative skill, and AMPB is halfway between. So this is a very general high-level snapshot. So I will talk about the AMPB. I don't have slides, but I will uh, talk, just talk through it. 
And I think that could make it a bit more interesting in talking rather than showing you a, 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 a hot, hot slot. The Bachelor of Finance AMPB program was started three years ago. So the first cohort is now in the third year. And uh, if you are coming in into this program, you will be the fourth cohort. So backtrack a little bit, what is this asset management in private banking? Why did Hong Kong you put this program together three years ago? Um, Hong Kong, I bet all of you would have heard, would have understand or would have known, Hong Kong is an, it's an international financial center. Okay. So Hong Kong is one of the major international financial center in the world and obviously the center in Asia. So, uh, uh, and finance, banking, investment, asset management are the cornerstone of the Hong Kong's economic development. And when we look at the Hong Kong macro environment, Hong Kong want to continue as an IFC, International Financial Center, and the government, the Hong Kong SR government, also position Hong Kong as a wealth management and asset management center. So that was the government's, actually the official positioning of Hong Kong possibly back three, four, five years ago, when Hong Kong you think, oh, what, it's a program that will help Hong Kong to build and develop its niche. And that's where Hong Kong you at that point in time put together well, this is an area that is development, developing very quickly, asset management and private wealth, development very quickly. There are a lot of talent shortages in this sector. And the industry and the government was also pushing very hard to develop and talent in this sector. And that's the background. Hong Kong, you put this program together and the first cohort was admitted three years ago. And I was the first program director coming into Hong Kong U to manage this program. A lot of students and parents would ask, so am I stepping into a very, very narrow learning scope? Because this program is so narrow, it's called asset management, private banking. Would that limit my learning curve, my learning experience? or my career, or career goal into any other fields. Um, I have parents asking this question a few times. Um, my immediate answer to you is, if you come into this program, you will be learning all the basic courses of economics, finance, statistics, corporate finance, etc. So you will be learning all the basic courses that a uh, student in accounting and finance, that a student in economics and finance, that a student in BBA and a student in quantifying will be learning. So you would be learning all the basic courses related to economics, finance and investment. Okay. And what makes this program different and unique? It's as a program director, as someone coming in from the industry, I am trying to put into a lot of out of classroom learning activities for my students. Classroom learning, possibly it's the same everywhere. So you got to go into a class, microeconomics, macroeconomics, corporate finance. So basically inside the classroom, I, th I think the, the differences and the variances would be very, not very huge. And I truly believe what make a student different, what make a student stand out, is the out of classroom learning. And also a learning opportunity from someone from the industry. Okay. In this AMPP program, a number of core courses that you are required to take. I mean, you can go on our website and look at some of the core courses in the program. Um, possibly between four to five core courses are taught by industry practitioners. 
either people like me who retired from the industry or adjunct professors who are still working in industry and spend their time now to teach the program. So if you take AMPB, you would be learning all the basics as well as learning uh, very industry specific courses uh, taught by industry professionals. As a graduate in AMPB, it doesn't bar you. It doesn't limit you that you have to work in the asset management private bank industry. You can equally work in consulting firm. You can equally work in um, uh, 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 banks. You can equally work in advisory, etc. Just like any other students in economics, in finance, in quantifying, they can equally start the career in asset management and private banking. Okay. So which degree you, you did or which program you did does not bar you from entering into any sector. Okay. Um, before I go into telling you or giving you some more um, uh, uh, information about the outs of the classroom activities that I work together with my students, I would like just to show you a video. Uh, this video is produced by year one student. Okay, so my AMPB year one student produced this video in April, just before they start the exam. Unfortunately, this year, I mean, with the COVID-19, I mean, the students did not have the opportunity to come back and to work on the video. So this video was actually produced last year by last year's year one student. So if you sit back and think they are year one student who produced this video, and now you're ready to come into the university. So you're just one year, one year behind them. But just look at the one year difference that could possibly shape them with a one year experience at Hong Kong U and at the asset management and private banking program. So I let you watch this video and then I add my commentary after this seven minutes video. Last year, when we conducted a second private wealth management uh, survey, the asset management were US dollar 800 billion. And this year, the AUM4, the PWM industry, have grown to US dollar 1 trillion. According to the survey by the SFC in July, which represent a solid 26% growth. The growth shows that Hong Kong continues to be the preeminent private wealth management hub that attracts wealth individuals, families, and we certainly believe that the growth prospects will make very strong for us. Director for the Asset Management and Private Banking Program and managed the program since it was first launched in 2017. I was a banker in the finance industry for over 30 years before I moved into the academia field and took up my current position. One of the activities that I found most useful was the coffee chat. The students in small groups of four and five who have an hour or more to coffee chat with the industry practitioner in the private banking or the asset management industry. We name them guest mentor. The guest mentor will share with the students his or her own career experience and also share some useful advice for the students to get prepared for the upcoming challenges for their study and for their career path. 
So among all those various activities offered by AMTV, what impresses me most is the coffee chat. A coffee chat is so much more than a cup of coffee. What I value most is the person that I have coffee with, the reasons behind how they step into the industry and work all the way up to where they are now, the daily routines of an insider, and the golden tips to foster a trusted relationship with billionaires, and so on and on and on. So everybody has a unique story. The more you hear, the more you ask, and the more you learn. Learning in AMPB is not limited by the three walls of the classroom. For example, our program director, Professor Anna Wong, arranges coffee chats every semester where students get into smaller groups of four or five, and each group gets to meet a different practitioner in the industry. Also, there's an event called an activity finance, and at the end of the event, we also have a trading simulation session, and I think that for all of us, we have a better idea of how the industry works and the different roles in the finance industry, and I believe that all of these experiences were a valuable one for everyone. Lastly, I need to mention a little bit about the curriculum. Other than the basic courses in economics, accounting, math, statistics, and finance, the asset management and private banking curriculum embedded practical oriented courses taught by teachers with solid experience in the industry, including a final year capstone course requiring the students to apply their knowledge into a case of managing a portfolio of high net worth individual or institutional money. Apart from the general finance courses, this program also offers different specific finance courses that focus on the development, trend, and practical skills of the industry. For example, credit and lending in private banking and the regulation in AMPB field. All these courses are taught by practitioners and all of the curriculum and material examinations held by professional bodies such as HKIB. The exclusive final year project could also help us understand the daily operation and a different role of the industry. After four years of education, the students are expected to equip themselves with the essential and practical skills of the industry. The students will also have the opportunities to do company visits. In their first year, the students visited the Hong Kong Stock Exchange. They visited two banks and met with the CEOs and their senior management team. And the students spent a whole afternoon in each of the bank. They were also able to meet with the Undersecretary of the Financial Services and Treasury Bureau. One of the activities that I enjoyed the most in the Connectivity in Finance program is the Amplified Training Activity. We have the opportunity to simulate and play the roles of hedge fund managers and the traders in investment banks. We have to look out for immediate news and also fluctuating prices. This gives us an opportunity to taste how the sales and trading works. This is really fun and challenging. This program has actually deepened my understanding of the finance industry. We could know more about the background and the unique features of these companies. I believe that the future of this industry could be unprecedentedly bright and promising, and more human talents will be needed. To be honest, I did not know anything about the finance or private banking industry before the Connectivity and Finance Program. Having visited Julius Bear, I was able to understand the features of private banking and the essence of a very traditional Swiss bank. Most importantly, I went to the bank having an impression that it is a deteriorating industry, but came up with the idea that AR was just another tool to help with the bank offices. Ultimately, high net worth individuals value time and effort a bank instead, something computers can never do. This has truly inspired me, and with the other visits, it encouraged me to be more enthusiastic about this industry. In their second year, the students were able to participate in corporate series events whereby they would have the opportunity to join roundtable talks and met with four asset management companies. And the students will have the opportunity to be selected as one of the summer interns. Industry mentoring is another opportunity that the students would have. The students will be able to join the mentorship program of the Professional Investment Institute and learn from the mentor throughout the year. I'm one of the participants of the Asset Management Corporate Series, which is in collaboration with CSOP, Telepartners, and Perfect Technologies. 
Here are several seminars that the senior professionals from each of the companies came to share with us. They allow us to know more about how the asset management companies work, what the opportunities and challenges are in the future. I really got to know more about the first line information in the industry and also gained much insights from my professionals. After the sharing sessions, we also needed to finish a group project about the recent issues in asset management field. After all, it's my great pleasure that I got the opportunity of having a summer internship program in one of the company's many partners. I can really have the hand-on working experience in one of the famous asset management companies in Hong Kong. With my background, I'm a strong believer of learning outside of the classroom and therefore strive to provide my students with as many opportunities as possible to reach out to the industry as early as possible. As my students interact with the industry leaders or industry practitioners, especially in small groups or on an individual basis, they will learn and develop and that will make them stand out. In sum, the Asset Management and Private Banking Program aims to provide students with solid academic skills in investment and finance, connect the students to the industry throughout their four years of university study, and prepare them for a career in the finance world. Um, I hope all of you have enjoyed this video. As I just mentioned, this video is prepared and short, short by year one students. So they are only one year ahead of you. I was amazed by the quality of the video. I did not give any advice. I did not give any advice or comments or guidance of how they run the video. They just come to interview me and then they prepare it. So I hope you've enjoyed it and I'm sure you, after reading this video, you, you have a feel of a, some, some, some kind of feel about how the program is being managed. As I mentioned, uh, within AMPB, you have your major in AMPB and all of the core courses that you have to take. No doubt, you have to complete all the courses. And, and as I mentioned, learning in the classroom possibly the difference is not big and all the, on all the courses, or, sorry, all the classes or subjects in the AMPP program, everyone in the faculty can take it as elective. So that's the, the reason I mentioned classroom uh, lectures possibly is the same in every program. But the, what makes this program unique is the ability for you to meet with or to connect to the industry as early as your year one. So in the year one, in the year one, you would have opportunity to go out and visit banks, visit the stock exchange, and learn from your visits. And then the most helpful or the most, uh, the most, the event that helped you to develop the best is the coffee chat that is being arranged. So each term, in your group of four or five, you'll be able to meet with someone working in the industry. And a coffee chat, there's no commitment. You just go and ask and chat and just learn as you meet people. So in your three or four years education, you'll have a lot of these opportunities to be connected to the industry. Whether it's roundtable seminars, company visits, coffee chats, or joining as a member of industry's um, professional bodies. So that's, that's the opportunity that you will have in this program. Someone will ask, so Professor Wong, so you are offering so many, uh, a lot of value added activities for your students. How is it being managed? So my quick answer is this class or this program, we admit possibly a very low number of students so that 
it's manageable. In the first year when we first start the program, we only admitted 20 students. So that's the first cohort. And in the last, when then we expanded to 30 and 35. So in the upcoming year, possibly we will further expand to 40, the max. So we will hope that we would maintain this program uh, small enough uh, so that all these activities can be personally arranged. Um, some students will ask, does the program guarantee internship? So because a lot of people will be interested other than exchange opportunities, which you will definitely have to have it if you join Hong Kong U. And a lot of people will also be curious whether there's any internship uh, opportunity confirmed. My quick question is, we, we means the faculty, the university, or the program itself, we do not, we do not guarantee internship. But we would prepare you for the internship. The word prepared, the activities that the program arranged, the coffee chat, the company visits, is exactly preparing you for your internship and for your career. The more you meet with people, the more you meet with, if I should use the word adult, so the more you meet with people, adult and industry practitioner, the more you will learn how to deal with people and deal with your potential interviewer and develop your knowledge and interest in the industry. That's how we prepare you for your internship and prepare you for your career. Of course, in the faculty, we have our career office, which would be connecting with the outside world to bring in opportunities, bring, with, bring in positions that everybody will apply. So one of my role is really to get you exposed in the industry and prepare you to get more deep understanding of the industry. But on, on that note, you still need to ensure that you do well in your classroom, you do well in your, in your exams and grades, but you need to participate more in activities. So some of the faculty's activities will be case studies. I encourage my students to do as many case studies as possible. And the case study is also a way to enhance your uh, uh, understanding to the industry. So I think I would pause here um, uh, and, and just open the discussions to any students who have anything to ask or want to know a bit more. Hi. Yes, please. Uh, hi, Professor Wong. Um, I'm an international student from Indonesia. Sure. And I was actually wondering um, whether you have admitted students from the IB diploma program from the past. Uh, okay, so um, let me, let me, actually I have um, one Indonesian student currently in, in her year three. Okay. You can just find out who she is and just do your uh, normal um, chit chatting and networking with her. Um, in the 35 students I mentioned, so I said we admit, we offered about, okay, we hope to get 35 students. Okay. But obviously, as an IB student, and then my, my plan or my target was half half. So half would be DSE local students and half would be IB students. So that's my plan but the actual outcome definitely will be very different from the plan because especially for IB students, IB students have the opportunity to apply a number of universities even in Hong Kong you can apply for two three four universities and also you have the options of applying for universities around the globe okay so for IB students uh, 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 the actual number that's finally come, it's fluid. Fluid in the sense that we may offer 50, 60, 70, 80 students, and eventually maybe only 10, 20, 15, that 20 that eventually come, okay? So, so going back to your um, question, yes, we did admit possibly half and half. So in the students about 32, 33 last year, I think we have, a, I have about half of them are actually from IB. And, but I, but uh, as I mentioned, IP students, 
I think all of you are now on the, on the Zoom meeting are, are IP students or international students, so non-DSE. Non so, so you would have a number of applications and choices and we will be giving out offers much more than the target that we hopefully would achieve. So my target is half, hopefully half would be from non-DSE. And if I plan to admit 40 or 40-ish, 40 I hope to have 20-ish non-DSE non students, IB slash international students. Yeah, okay, thank you. And Is there then, any... And then the, um, the diversity, the international diversity of the AMPP students, we have students from Korea, we have students from Taiwan, we have students from Indonesia, we have students from Singapore, we have students from India, we have students from Indonesia, Malaysia, and also from the mainland, other than local Hong Kong students. So the uh, representation diversity in the MPP is really great. Right, okay, thank you. Are there any subject requirements for those doing IB? And no, this program? other than the, the minimum requirement, I think you have a second language. I mean, there's no specific program requirement. It's such a general university requirement. Okay, thank you. And then if you look at the program, I think for IB, it, this is 38, I think. I, I can't remember well, but then uh, it's on our website. So if you, if you think you can get, um, is it, uh, uh, let, do we have some number here? The admission minimum. Let me just refresh myself. Sure. But if not, please look into our website. I think we have a minimum or expected um, acceptance number in, in the website. And I believe it's between 38 to 40, but I can't exactly remember. Yeah, it's 38. We saw in your website. It's, it's 38. 38. Is it 38? Yeah, 38. Yeah, okay. Yeah, the minimum. The minimum, yeah. yeah. And then we, give, we, we would give conditional offer. So you would, uh, if you submit your application, you would expect to have a video I mean, interview. And then after the interview, we would be given our conditional offers. Depending on the performance in your interview, we may give you a conditional offer 39, 40, or 38, depending on the performance. And then we ha do have experience in the previous year that if we give out a conditional offer 39, but eventually you got 38, then you can appeal and then we'll reassess the situation. And then I know to this year, there would be some uh, uncertainties because of the COVID situation and that we would be following the university's approach. Um, let me see if there's any uh, question coming in from, from the... Um, this one question, are there any admission statistics for GCE students? We also did uh, admit GCE students in the last few years, and the minimum was, I believe, uh, A star, A star, and A. That was on the website, okay? Uh, again, as I mentioned, we give conditional offers, at least based on what we have in, in, the, in, the, in the website. We may be giving three A star conditional offer, and if you miss one little subgrade, please do appeal. And, and we would consider it most appeal seriously. Uh, for IB students, is TOEFL test required? Uh, it's not compulsory required because we look at your IB English grade. But if you have that as an additional, if you think that additional TOEFL results can help you further, please just give it to us. But I IB students, TOEFL is not compulsory. Do you um, take the SAT? Yes, we do. But I can't recall the standard for the SAT. Uh, I think the, the faculty can, can, you can just write an email to the faculty and then, or to the admission, we double check the SAT minimum. Um, do you think, I mean, um, can we take IELTS instead of TOEFL? They're the same, right? Yes, yes, okay. yes. Actually, IELTS is more common. Oh, okay. Yeah, if you ask me IELTS, I can quickly tell you 7, 7.5 is our number. But TOEFL, I can't recall. 
Because okay. IELTS, IELTS is it's the more, more commonly used exam. Thank you. Okay, I have the another question is what was the acceptance rate like last year? This is a question that I would be reversing my, my, my answer. I did mention earlier we give offers at multiple time of our, uh, of our target. Okay, because IB students, you do have a lot of opportunities. Okay, so, so possibly we, if we, I'm planning to accept 20 students in non-DSE, we would be possibly giving out offers like four or five times. So, I don't, so that, that's how we work for the um, international students. So it's not like acceptance rate. Okay, so I cannot give an acceptance rate uh, per se. Um, another question is, can I defer one day after, a year after I get the offer? Um, you cannot defer, but you can reapply in a year later using the same results. Your results is good for two years. I, okay, uh, I might uh, I might not be get, uh, uh, giving you the right answer, but if um, if uh, the Hong Kong U Councilor can help me, uh, the results your public exams result is good for two years, so you can reapply next year using your prior year's result, but you cannot officially defer your acceptance of uh, offer. Um, where is this one? So another stu uh, a student was, if you combine two years result, basically you have year one A level and you year two A level, you combine it together to apply the program. Uh, my, my quick answer for me, there's no disadvantage. Um, uh, you can just, because that's legally um, program level and university level, you are allowed to combine your results for the application. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, the Hong Kong U Councillor who is also here. Okay, so are scholarship available for international students? I leave this to the Councillor to answer it right now. Yeah, uh, sure. Uh, so a uh, quick answer to that is definitely yes. We do offer entrance scholarship to international students as well. And uh, basically the entrance scholarships, they're all merit-based meaning uh, we will consider you based on your based on the final result that you get from your uh, public exam. So uh, perhaps if uh, you're still unclear, we can uh, talk about it uh, later on because it's more related to general application. So now maybe students can you know, ask more uh, about the program. Okay, let me finish the other question, which possibly is the, it's, it's the admission uh, by the program. The question is, other than academic result, exam result, of course, which is the prerequisite, okay? Um, what other things are required? Yes, you definitely need to put in a personal state statement in your application, and, and that will go into together with the interview. So in the interview, uh, possibly you would not, I, I would not ask you what's your exam result, because th that's clear. So in your interview, would likely ask about your personal statement. So that would be one of the things that we look at, to decide whether we're happy with a conditional offer and where, at what level do we put the conditional offer. That would be taken into account in the interview and in the conditional offer conditions. In other words, are there any overseas experience opportunities during the course of the AMPP course? The overseas experience would be, what? Would be the exchange, the exchange program. Okay, so you will have an opportunity for a one term exchange and that exchange program will be applying to the whole faculty students. So AMPB would not be having a specific overseas opportunity, but that would fall under the faculty's exchange program. And if I recall my first cohort, my 20-ish students, I bet over 70% of them take the opportunity for a gap term, okay, for an exchange for a term or a few of my students actually take a gap term and then they come to me for my advice. The gap term, and a few students are doing uh, a full-time job for one term or one year here in Hong Kong and, and possibly they find a job elsewhere. And one of my students actually take a gap term for some non-program related exposure in France. 
So my personal opinion is I highly recommend students to gap whether, uh, and in most cases, the gap would be working in a company in Hong Kong and have students working in Hong Kong Monetary Authority for a year, gap in a year, and have students working in HSBC as a trainee, an intern trainee for one term. We call it cooperative trainee. And they come to my, for my advice, I 100%, more than 100% support students taking a gap. Um, Okay, scholarship, I leave it to um, the counselor up later, later. And this, what are the advantages of taking AMPP over the other bachelor program? I mentioned earlier, studying itself, I think is the same. You can study AMPP, you can study economic and finance, you can study quantify. The studying element, I think is the same in most programs. And the advantage that AMPP provides, it's the out of the classroom activities that the program or basically myself that work for you to bring you out to see the industry. We would bring, I do not physically bring you, but I arrange opportunities for you to learn outside of the classroom. And I think that is one of the very, very um, uh, 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 niche thing that the AMPP provide, which other programs would not be able to cater. Um, I'm happy to take emails, questions afterwards. If you, any of you have questions, please send me an email either through the admission office or directly to my email. You can find me on Hong Kong News website. I'm happy to share any uh, 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 questions that you like to ask. I may not be giving you an answer, but I hope to give you an additional dimension of uh, your decision of where to go, which program to go, and your career path. Okay. 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 So, um, I think I'm. Um, I I'm leaving here, so I would be leaving the um, the the chat room or the Zoom meeting. Nice and happy to have all of you with me today for this half an hour. All right. Uh, so, uh, everyone, uh, if if you still have uh, questions for Ms. Anna Wong, you you can uh, ask now. You can still ask now. Can students? Oh, there's one, Professor Wong. Um. Oh. Okay. So uh, that one is related to general application, I think, not related to program. So uh, everyone, do you still have any questions for the AMP program? So if not, I will, uh, I think I'll thank you, Professor uh, Wong for her time today. Okay. okay. It's great seeing all of you. Bye-bye. Yeah. Bye -bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. All right. So um, right now, before we move on to uh, the next uh, presentation, uh, maybe I'll take uh, the time here when everyone is here uh, to uh, tell you a bit more about um, the HAU application. So uh, I think uh, while, uh, while many of you here are interested in HAU programs, but uh, I guess uh, some of you are still uh, have not applied yet, but are thinking of making an application already. So uh, I'll now give you some tips uh, on how on, like, to make an, app an HAU application. So now HAU, we still accept applications until um, July the 15th. And uh, in each application, uh, you can choose up to five program choices. And then uh, every, uh, for every program, they will uh, review your application individually. So uh, it is possible that uh, a student uh, to, for a student to have multiple offers, meaning you, you, will have, uh, you, you can have uh, more than one offer, say two, three, or even four offers. Okay. So uh, if you do have multiple offers, you only have to pay uh, one deposit to accept all offers, meaning you just have to pay a uh, deposit once to uh, accept all. And uh, in HAU, uh, everyone is concerned uh, 
of scholarship. And here we, are, uh, we do not need uh, any separate application for scholarship. Once you submit your application, we will um, consider you for scholarship if there's any. And uh, all the uh, scholarship, um, like what we call entrance scholarship, they are merit-based. Um, uh, you will be evaluated for uh, scholarship, like based on uh, your exam results. Okay, and uh, I still have a few more minutes before we move on to the next presentation. Uh, I may uh, as well show you. I may as well show you um, where you can find, you know, inf uh, information on the admission standards and also uh, subject uh, requirements, specific subject requirements. Okay. So basically, in Hong Kong U, we are very uh, transparent with um, the requirements that we are looking for. So you can uh, check out our international undergraduate uh, admissions website. And once you're here, you can uh, press the red button here, admissions, okay? And then you will be, you will be on this page. So you will see, uh, basically, there are a few steps. Uh, for you to check before you uh, uh, like to make sure that you meet the requirements of the programs. You can click here, admissions requirements. And uh, for example, if you're taking the IB, then you can, then you will see um, the scores you're looking for. Right. So for every program, we have listed out uh, the lower boundary, the minimum requirement, uh, minimum score requirement for each program. Okay, so here we have our I, uh, requirements for IB, you also have GCA level and SAT. So in case you're not from uh, these applications, uh, you can just go back to the previous, web, previous page and then scroll down and then um, select like uh, the qualification that you're taking. For example, if you're from Australia, you're taking the uh, ATA, then uh, we have listed out the requirements we have. Okay, so uh, just now some of you may ask, oh, um, if I'm taking the IB, do I have to take, you know, uh, is there any sp specific subjects that I have to take? You can also check uh, under program specific requirements. We uh, basically have the requirements listed for uh, all programs. Okay. You can find the details here. For example, access management, then it's all listed here. Okay. So uh, I think that's pretty much what I want to share. And uh, now I think uh, the next speaker is Joseph. I think you're ready, right? So uh, I'll now pass the time to you. Okay. Okay, so can you all hear me? Yes, I can. I can. So I, I think for the participants, can they actually respond to me? So because actually I want to make this into a more interactive section. So if I'm asking some question later on to, to ask your, your feeling or your, your ideas. So feel free to, to tell us what you, you, you see or what you, you, are, you are thinking. Okay. So to kickstart, first of all, thank you very much to join these sections. So I'm Joseph, Joseph Chen. I'm program lead of the program EDI, Entrepreneurship, Design and Innovations. And it is very really nice to have all of you here virtually. And to kick start, I think I will start to share some of the, the slides. Okay, this is the program name. Okay, let me change it a little bit. So first of all, thank you again and welcome everyone. I want to pose the first question to get your reaction. And I've got a list of companies here. What do you see the similarities among them? Anyone, anyone could share your thought? So I've got here Airbnb, Uber, Sequoia, Beyond Meat, 
uh, Ant Financial, Facebook, Huawei, Netflix, LinkedIn, Tesla, Amazon, DJI, Alibaba, TikTok. So what do you think the similarities among them? Anyone? So you can actually unmute yourself and then say it, what is your thought. All oh, quiet, all oh, quiet. Give it a try, give it a try. So when, when we are talking about EDI, when we are talking about innovation, of course, one thing that is very important, it is to engage in the process. So anyone want to give it a try? Yeah, I'll give it a shot. Uh, to me, it looks like they're all pretty big. <laughs> okay, they are, they're pretty big. Well, I do agree with you. I picked some big names. But obviously, these big names, I haven't added in like the HSBC, I haven't put in the JP Morgan, and I haven't put in Coca-Cola. So obviously, I want you to, to see the other similarities among this group from, let's say, Coca-Cola or, or HSBC. Like, which one? Who start? Um, they are all big names. Can, can I answer? Sure, give it a go. Um, they all have an online platform kind of thing. Okay, they all got the online platform. Uh, I would say mainly it will be yes, but not totally all. The reason is, is that we have got the DJI. So do you know what DJI is doing? Uh, drones. So they're doing, doing drones. And obviously I couldn't say it is not electronic related. It is not internet related, but their main product is, is, the, is the drone. And how about Sequoia? This is actually quite a test. I would be a little bit excited if any of you know what Sequoia is, is doing. Of course, maybe you are smart enough and then you open the Google and then you quickly check it out. But without checking it out, without Googling it, do you know what Sequoia is, is doing? No. Ah, uh, no? Yes. So basically, this is actually the expected response because Sequoia, it is one of the VC. They are the venture capital investor. And if we look at all these big companies, all these big names, and what I would say is, is that they are proposing, they have been developing what I've put down here, disruptive multidisciplinary innovations. What do you mean by, by disruptive? meaning that it changed the way people live. Like Airbnb, they haven't got any ownership of any hotel, but they are one of the largest, you can say the, the hotel chain or accommodations when you traveled. They, they are doing this kind of, of, of business, which you all know about it. And if we look at, let's say Facebook. Facebook, it is hard to define what their business in the past because they create a new community. They create a new way that people use to, to work on their social life. And, but obviously, maybe some of you, you are saying that, okay, Facebook is too old. And then you are not using Facebook anymore. You are using IG or you are you're using others. But at least it actually changed the way people use the internet to do the socializing. And Amazon. And if we are looking at the, the, the business nowadays in the past, let's say, half a year, because of the coronavirus. One of the, the, the business that hasn't told the world that they are suffering, they are Amazon. Because they are doing the, the online shopping, they are doing the delivery service. And that is why, although everyone's are going through a tough time on the, because of the coronavirus, still they are doing quite strong in their business. So in some way, it changed the way people live. And because of, of all this, if you are looking at the bottom right hand corner, it also changed the, the, the way that what are the jobs in, are in the market. Because I know that this is an a, 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 a introductory section of the, the program. And usually, I would say almost like 90% of the participants will ask the question, how is the, the job opportunities is like? And that is why I kickstart with what is the change of the job market? And if you're looking at it, we are talking about there are more startups and even for the large corporate or whether we are talking about SME, they are, we are talking about the insight management that they are going to see how the world is changing, how we should respond to, to, to the business environment. And there's the community management, 
there's the data management. Now we are talking about IoT, we are talking about all those data, and how are we going to make use of, of all those? And we have got innovation management. And of course, when we are talking about innovation management, even for the large corporates, they're talking about change policy, the change management. But of course, it, all, these, all these companies, all these big names that you can see on the screen, they start from a small business. But then they keep on doing the R&D and they are keep on getting the different investment. That is where the Sequoia is, is coming in. But of course, Sequoia is, is coming in in the later round of the investment. But still, it is talking about getting the, the, the different the, 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 the investor to the invest money into it. And that's why we have got the VC fund manager. And when the company are trying to get their, their trainee, they are not just looking at, okay, I want an accountant trainee. I want, uh, let's say, a design trainee. No, it is not like that anymore. They want the new, um, like, let's say the employees or the participants, they want them to be all rounded so that they can actually coordinate amongst the different departments and also try to work out the, you can say the new working styles and try to work out the new project. And obviously the incubator as well. And that would include in Hong Kong, then we know about, of course, the large institutes like the Science Park or the Cyberport. But of course, there are a lot of other incubators as, as, as well. And in the past, I have heard that some of the students say, what are the sexiest jobs in, in, in the world? And they, they are saying that, okay, I want to become a banker. But of course, there are still people that they still want to be a banker. And I wouldn't say those are not sexy enough. But actually, there are a new group of the, the, the job or the role. We have got the VC fund manager. The reason is that they are looking at all the different projects. They're thinking about whether they can actually use the funding to invest in any of it. And, and that is why it is now becoming the new normal. So although these are all big names, and there'll be other new names coming in, and other new names, they will become big again, or they are actually giving impact to society. And that is why we are living in a, a world that is keep on changing and then keep on moving forward. And oh. so I can hear someone. Is that a question or, or something? If not, I, I, I'll carry, carry on. And that brings it to who I am. So obviously you, you know my name, I, I'm Joseph. And my background, apart from I am leading a program here in the University of Hong Kong, is that I'm also dealing with the dis different disciplines, development and projects. Like the, the, this one, the top left-hand corners, that is our technology development projects that we use blockchain to see how we can put it in the, the entertainment, putting it into the e-gaming the, the, the e business. And then on the bottom right-hand corner, I've got the, the two photos. Those are my projects. So there are, those are my projects in Middle East about the, the, the mixed use development of the, the, the smart city, the urban planning, and also the architecture. And also for the bottom left-hand corner, that is actually some cultural project that I'm, I'm working on. In which that is what we see the future will need. That is that any one of you, of course, you need to, to build up your expertise, but that is not enough. Apart from the expertise, you also need to be able to manage, to coordinate, to work with the other disciplines. And this is exactly what EDI is about. And always I would like to ask my students, why are you coming to the universities? Why are you picking, say, this program? Why are you actually picking these courses? And I, I would like to see what is the reason behind it. And after I've talked to many of them, I, I think it, it would be a good, say, good time for the, the information sections for, for me to share. I always believe in this one statement, is that when you are coming to the universities, when you are coming to the business school, one thing that is important both for yourself and also for your, your future career or your future project collaborator or your, your future employer is that we are here during these few years we research and then we teach the aspects of how to create and manage value. And of course, value, we, it is not just about the dollar sign, which is similarly, uh, this is important, but also of other value as, as well. So maybe it is the personal values, 
Maybe it is the social values. And that is why we have got the BBA Entrepreneurship Design Innovation Program. And also, and then we have got the summer program is called the, the CIEC, Creativity Innovation Entrepreneurship in China. And I know that all of you, when you are in, in the high school and then you must have heard a lot of it, you must have heard a lot of the, the STEM education, or if they are adding the A in, A stand for art, it may be the STEAM education. And also when we are looking at the, the budget from the government, they are talking about putting a lot of money to develop the, the students' ability on the different technology, like the AI, blockchain, cloud computing, big data, all those. But my question that I would like to ask, is that enough? If that is not enough, what is the missing puzzle? What is the miss, missing bit? Because otherwise, everyone, they are the, the technician. They are the technology guy. What we are, we are looking at here is, is that although technology is, is deeply embedded in all the business, like for like the, the, the diagram on the left, it is the, the company, they are, they are using or they are developing the, the blockchain technology all the way from the, the year 2014. But in, in this, when they want to make the technology have an impact to society or the industry, they, want to, they need to make sure that the market adoption, it is good enough. And also it is creative enough. And also it needs to have the, the one way important part, it is called the empathy, how much you know the users. So it is all through this combination of the technology and also empathy, that means that you understand the, the user needs. When you combine the two together, you got the real innovation. And, and also when we are looking at what has actually changed our industry or our business very much is that a lot of it, it is involving data. Whether you are talking about big data or when you are talking about the, the data security and it is almost like it is around us. You cannot run away without actually involving any of the data on the aspects that you are, you are, you are coming across. And that is why from the report from KPMG, they are saying that the revenue per, per year, it is estimated to be 274 billion, big money. And no matter which company you are, you are, you are looking at, 274 billion, it is a big money. And it is about if you can actually know how to make use of the data, if you can actually do good analysis, and then you can actually come up with something of a good application of the data, it will drive the business. And that is why going back to, to the first slide, that is why a lot of companies, they are looking for insights manager. And insights manager, one of the tasks is also to look at how to get the data and then to make best use of it. And if you want to get more information about the EDI major, apart from these sections, we have got a Q&A later on, and you can also go on to our website. You can search Hong Kong U, BBA, EDI, and then you can straight go to our website to get the information, which I'm going to, do, to, to look into it in, in detail. And apart from all those big names that we talk about and in the first slide, they are the disruptive innovation. But still, for our students, after they graduate, some of them, they still get into all those other big names. And so the reason is, is that they maybe they, they want to go for the, the conventional business or maybe actually they can actually want to do something with the, the large business like Accenture and Goldman Sachs or even HSBC, as I say, they, they will have the department. They would have the department to promote the innovation and also they want to order the new employees to be able to, to adapt to the new working environment and then to the, the new, new society. And, and that's why a lot of our students, they will also go into the, 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 the big names company. But I'm not saying that you shouldn't go for doing startup on your own, or you shouldn't go to, to join the SME, because we also got students joining those. Depends on what is your career vision. And when we ask about we actually, when we were having some executive education, executive education meaning that they are the business leaders, 
and they, they want to further develop their, 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 their business or their knowledge, they, some of them, they, they come to Hong Kong U. And I've asked them, how business leaders, how are you going to relate the education that is going to support you? One thing that when you look at the, the, all the, 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 the items on the left, those are the executive education uh, students that, that is actually giving me the, uh, who they are from, where they are from, who they are. And they all say that some of the key element here, it is first, it is the empathy, meaning that it involves all the stakeholders. Second, it is about the, the management, management of the people management, business, and all the different management, and including the, again, in the first slides, insights, communities, innovations, and also to look at what is the values of the different business. All come together, basically we can summarize in a term is called entrepreneurship. And this is why we have got in this EDI program. And previously in the EDI program, we have got another name, we call it the BDI, Business Design and Innovation. Although we already got the, the, the entrepreneurship component in the BDI program, but we are thinking, of, thinking that we should actually give more focus or, or more, more weight on our entrepreneurship. That's why the, the, the curriculum, the, the program, we have enriched it. And also we change the name to EDI, Entrepreneurship Design and Innovation. And for entrepreneurship, we are looking at mindset, we are looking at getting the, the, the students to, to build up their, their own project, not necessarily, again, to, to start their, their own, own company. It can be a, an individual project that is actually within a, a, a corporate or their, obviously their, their own sub project. And how an entrepreneur, they can be the game changer and how they can actually look at the market, study the market, and then to introduce uh, the dis disruptions. Or how are the global co corporates going to do their innovations? Apart from global, obviously we have got the local as well. What will be the local venturing is, is about what is the, the, the background, what is the, the environment, what's the, the requirement, what's the market out there, and then we have got the, 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 we look at the corporate infrastructure, evaluations, governance, risk management. These are all being covered in, in our program. And obviously we have been working with a lot of the external corporate in, in basically in, in the different, different layer, different, different aspects. And one project that we have been working with, it is the China Resource Group and Waiyun. So when we are working with them, basically they are also putting a lot of the, the investment into promoting the, the, the innovation. And that is why we call it the innovative ecosystem. And we have been working with them. And if you are looking at the slides and within the same program, there are other universities and there are the Deloitte as well. And they're they are all basically, we including the business consultancy, we including us as our academics, and then including them from commercial China resources. Actually, it's built up a quite a good chem chemistry, but of course, we are not just talking about, they are the, the sole collaborators. We have got a lot of other collaborators as well. And going into, when we are talking about the innovative ecosystem, there are some key elements, key fields. First of all, we have got the upstream, midstream, and the downstream. And when you've got an, an idea on how to, 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 to impact on the, the people's habits or the, the impact on the business, or you have got a, a, a new idea for to commercialize some, some of the innovation. Of course, we have got the midstreams. We have got the business idea, development and operations, and we are going to build up the, our students to be able to develop their the ideas. And then, but with the ideas, with the money, it is not going anywhere. And that is why we are also looking at the upstream. What are the funding structure will be like? How are you going to get the funding? and how are the funding going to support your business idea. And after the upstream, midstream, if there's no user, then meaning that there's no market, then it is still not going anywhere. And that is why we are also looking at the downstream, that is the market adoptions, so that you know that your project can address the user need. And obviously we have got to logistics and business services going to support all these say, say the, 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 the innovation ecosystem and the, the whole process, and also to understanding the, the whole environment and the condition, which is, in, which is keep on changing. And that is why we have got the, the different programs. Some of it, it is actually within the, the semester. Some of it, it is during the, the summertime, 
And like these two, they are the, the program during the summertime. On the one on the right, we are working with Ocean Park to, to work out uh, a hackathon so that we come up with some new ideas to combine education and entertainment. And that is why you can see the new term, entertainment. And, and also we have got this project, this program, we call it the CIEC. And we brought our students to the Greater Bay Area to visit a lot of companies, which I'm going to cover a little bit later. And that is exactly the slides that I talk about. In a CIEC program, and that is actually a little, bit, a little bit less than a month and around three weeks. And then we have visited all the different type of companies because these are all going to, to this, they have shared their, their experience and actually what's their, their visions, their insights on entrepreneurship and also innovations. And actually it, the, the winter is so wide, it, it covers from the, the Hong Kong Exchange, Hong Kong Design Center, DHL, Science Park, and we have got the legal, legal experts, the, the idea. And then we, we even got the, the gaming industry, entertainment industry for Sense China. And when we visit, visit in, in the Greater Bay Area, we visit uh, the headquarters of Lee Kum Kee. And then we visit uh, also the, like the Chow Thai folk, what they're doing and in their retail business. And so basically it covers all the, all the aspects that in the previous slides that I talk about from the funding people to the business idea, corporate and, and, and company, to the, the, the company going to do the marketing and to, for the ones who know about the government policy. And that is what we are going to cover through the, the, the discussion and sharing with all these corporate. And this, I'm not going to touch too much, but basically we are in the age that there'll be a lot of innovation. And from the conventional business, there'll be digital transformation. And there are some keys to this digital transformation from design thinking all the way to, to open banking or the, the UI UX. And again, when we are talking about digital transformation, there are lots that we need to, to cover and a lot that we need the students to, to know about and then to try it. And that is why when they, when we are students going to build up their project, they are also going to look at the, the different levels from the very simple the graphics to the industrial design on the products, or they're going to, to work out the services, the, the interactions, or they're looking at the, the whole system. Okay, uh, on this two image, any one of you, you have actually seen it in the souvenir shop. Do you know? Yeah. Yeah, I've seen it before. So you, you have seen it. How do you think about it? Obviously, I've already given the answer. So I haven't actually asked you to ask, the, ask you lots to, to guess what it is. It is uh, a lemon squeezer. And it's, it is not an orange squeeze or orange juice squeezer. It is a lemon squeezer. How do you like this product? I, I think it's pretty great. I think the, the designer who made it, he was basically, I think he once said like, oh, I made this not to squeeze lemons well, but just mm. so people would talk about it. <laughs> yeah, it very true. And any other of, of you you want to share, what is your view on, on this lemon squeezer? Uh, even if you haven't seen it in person, from these two images, maybe you can actually make some guess. So if it is actually in front of you, how do, do you like it? Do you want to use it? Or do you want to give it as, as a present? Um, I would use it just for the, I mean, just for the fun of it. I wouldn't mm -hmm. really like, like want to use it, but just cause there is something like that, I wouldn't mind trying it out. Okay. And you know what, actually this is one of the, the I, I wouldn't want to say this is the greatest product in the world, but actually this has actually quite a big impact when it is in the market. The designer of this, it is, he's called Philip Stark. And when he's actually designing it, he really is looking at how, uh, it, how is it going to combine really the left brain and the right brain, meaning that are, he's looking at how is, how is it going to, to work out in terms of the, the logic wise, engineering wise, how is it going to work? But meanwhile, the reason why it is a very attractive product, indeed, it is one of the most popular product when it is in the market, I think it's around 15 to 20 years ago, is that it is one of the best souvenir. 
when people are having their, their friends moving into a new flat, they're thinking, okay, what should I give them as a souvenir? And they're thinking okay, about, okay, let's give this lemon squeezer. The, the people who get it, they may not use it to, to squeeze lemon. Indeed, I tell you the truth is that you need to hold it, otherwise it will be running away. And it is really not the best engineer lemon squeezer in the world, but it is looking cool. What is the good thing about looking cool is that when someone is putting it in a kitchen, suddenly it upgrades the kitchen. It feels like, okay, you got taste, you got style. And that is why when Philip Stark is designing it, he really is thinking about the, the people's feeling and also about engineering patterns as well. And this is what, when we are talking about innovation, we always, now it is not just single disciplines. We need to really to, 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 to motivate our left brain and our right brain. And on this slide, basically it is the SDG. SDG, it is the Sustainable Development Goals by the United Nations. And this is getting more and more important. On the really top level, country-wise, they are also looking at the, the poverty, about hunger, food, innovation, infrastructure, uh, climate, and life on land, life below water, all, all the 17 SDG. But indeed, even for the local levels, I think now basically all the business and all the different governments, they're also looking at how we can actually contribute to a better world. And that is why even in the Hong Kong Youth Sustainability Report 2019, we are also looking at how are the different courses, how are the different programs going to support the, 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 the SDG. Obviously for EDI, we are one, one of the programs that is actually contributing because when we are going to solve the different problem, we need to look at what is the core problem it is and where we can actually make the improvement, where we can actually unlock it. And that is why innovation is always one of the key things. And this is what our program is, training our students and then building up our students with the skills, knowledge, and also the mentality to do it. Although here I, I only circled number nine, but indeed a lot of it, it depends on how good you can actually use the different, different numbers or different, different parts to work out together. Because we are all keep on talking about collaboration and also a lot of the problem, it is actually linked. And that is why even when you're saying that, okay, I'm, I, I'm not looking into the technology. I'm not, in the, I'm not a technology guy. Uh, I'm more like a, a finance guy. Would the, the finance people need to look at the SDG? I can tell you it's yes. The reason is that now you can, apart from SDG, you can search on the ESG. ESG is the environmental, social, and governance. It is actually the criteria that even the finance, even the different company, they are looking at this governance to suggest their investor what would be the business be a better one so that they can actually looking after our environment and then to help to support a good social environment or society. And that is why what we are, we are, we are building up, it is actually, we can actually really build, build for giving some impact to the society. And when we are talking about innovation, the current trend is, is that it is not going away because actually all the different countries, they're all looking at how to improve their, 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 their people's life. China, obviously they, they have been doing quite a lot and Israel, they're the capital of the startup. There are a lot of the, the new ideas and new startup coming or new R&D coming up from, from Israel. Silicon Valley, of course, we know that, and especially if it is to do with the IT, with, to do with the digital. And it is almost like we are all in the competitions and how to actually get the, the business that we are, we are in to be a better business because the, the competition is, is so strong out there. And I'm not going to go into too much detail on the next few slides because what I just want to bring out the, 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 the message is that when we are looking at our, um, our world, as I said, data is very important and we're in the digital world. No matter we are, we are talking about the, the, the medical field, the greenery, the retail, mobility, asset management, we are all looking at the, all the different data that are going to be cross-referencing to each other. And that means why, 
why the, we, we keep on hearing the IoT, Internet of Things, why we have been hearing about the, the blockchain, why we have been hearing about the, the AI. Because actually they are all interrelated, they can all be improved digitally, and with the data, you can do a lot of different things. And for this slides, basically it is some of our students, they went on a trip in, in Huanqin, and this is actually uh, an office they're looking at the, the, you can say, the, the recharging system, because now we are talking about electric car. So they, they are building up the dashboard, which actually reflect all the different usage, the, the, the different conditions of the different charger, actually in, in the whole China. The cool thing of it is that with all this dashboard, with all this information, then they can, they can actually plan. If we need to build more, where should we put them? If we know where is the, the high usage, then we can actually put more over there. And then if there's somewhere that you, you, you find that the, the maintenance is not good, they can actually build up a better maintenance team. And that is why these are all driven by, by the data. And it is improving the e-transportation system. When you are coming to the universities, which let's say if you want to improve the transportation system, is that the, the only department that you should join is the engineering? The, what, I, I would tell you that it is not. Because apart from data that you get from the, from the engineer, actually it is about understanding of the business, understanding of the ecosystem, understanding of the user, which is all coming up from here. Because these are all we call the qualitative analysis. And for the qualitative analysis, it comes from the, basically starting from the individual person. And then with all this data coming together, we got the smart neighborhood and it is going to impact the cities. Again, not going into too much detail on, 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 on these few slides. But what I'm saying is if this technology can be improved further, can be developed further, if there's the, the next COVID-19, actually we can do it a lot better because the technology can combine the, the social interaction, location detection, and then the history of the medical, the health conditions, and the detection of sewage, and then if there's leak or waste conditions, if that all this information they are, they are interrelated, and if they are, we can actually cross-checking it. Next time when we have got the, the, the next COVID-19 or next maybe we call it the COVID-20, hopefully touch wood, we are not going to have another, another big problem, but we can actually respond quicker. We can actually do a better job. So this year, this, this time, even the Google and, and the Apple, they're saying that with the, the mobile, if you, if you read the news, you know that with, with the mobile, we can actually detect and to see how we can, going back to, to source, where is this, the, 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 the person who has got the, the, the virus. But actually we can do it a lot better. But of course, Apple and Google, they are trying out first. But actually, again, with all of you, you are going to develop your skill set. You are going to develop your expertise. Then with your input, next time with our, all our collaboration, then it is, it is going to be a much better responsive system. And of course, we will have different diagrams. We are looking at the, how to, to do the analysis of the, of the different data. And this one, again, during our visit, one of the, the company, they are even looking at, not just as Facebook, they're looking at the different relationship among people. And that's why they call it the social face. And the, the diagram on, on the bottom, I think it is quite a cool diagram because it shows how much interaction and how are the quality of the interact interactions are between the, the, the people. Of course, this is only the, the, the data. How to use it or how to have it to improve our life then there are a lot of, of opportunity, a lot of potential that we can explore. And like what Huawei is doing, telling us, and while we are visiting them, they are not just doing the mobile, they are not just doing the, 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 the 5G, they're also doing the infrastructure, they're looking at the oil, gas, they're looking at smart manufacturing, digital banking, and ecosystem, campus, interconnections. And going back, it is actually their statement, bringing digital to every person, home and organization for fully connected, intelligent world. Like it or not, this is the world that we are moving towards. And I think for the university programs, we need to actually build up and then to support you, to equip you so that you know how to live in this world, 
And not just that, you know how to contribute to this world and how to build this world. And a, a quick go through on our course structure, obviously because we are in under the BBA umbrella, so we, we still think we should actually equip you with the finance and economic knowledge, like the, the faculty core courses that we have got it on the left. And obviously we need to build up your business skills as well. That's why we have got the business core courses to support you from information system to marketing to strategic management. But as I say, in order for you to, to really to contribute and in order for you to implement your different ideas to add values, then we are looking at for the EDI program, these are the things that we want to build you towards. We want to, to build you towards, you know how to create your values, to innovate, you have got the ability to implement, to open up new potential, maybe with design thinking, and because design thinking is, is another top, hot topic and it is quite useful, or through the entrepreneurship from the funding to organization management, or ability to facilitate the ideas to among the stakeholders or to, to manage the stakeholders, and also to have the knowledge of the business environment. The ones on the, all on the, on, on in, in orange color, basically they are mirroring what the executive education are doing, meaning that it is not just MBA is doing it. And the Hong Kong UEDI program, we, are, we, we recognize that you have got the ability, you have got the intelligent really already to, to, to get to train up with all these aspects. That's why we are mirroring the executive education with all this goal. And in order to do it, we have got to, to look at the technology uh, creativities and economics ones, and also the artistic cultural ones to know about the people. And these are all being delivered through the disciplinary courses and on top of the, the business courses and also the faculty courses that we talked on the previous pages. And, and a few slides on what our students are doing. And this few slides, it is actually just this, this year, this academic year, and obviously before the city lockdown. And we have done some public engagement in, at Wanjai so that we can actually understand the neighbor more so that we can actually capture data to do innovation in the neighborhood. And this is to work with the neighborhood innovation lab. And also we have got another project that our students are working with a company called Avant Meet. And their founder, they are the Carrie Chen, she's one of the pioneer on the cultivated meat. Basically it is the alternative protein. Alternative protein meaning that if we are not really getting the, the meat, can we use the vegetables and then we can actually extract the protein so that it will support our nutrition as good as the, as the meat or the, as the fish. So we, we have got the tasting session and then we have got obviously because we couldn't have the physical class afterward and we have got the, the online discussion with Carrie and presentation to, to, to her. And this is from previous years and we were working with Asia Mouse and not just with the, 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 the front end stuff, we are working with the, the management team and this presentation we did it at the headquarters. So they are, our students are presenting a revolutionary dining experience and they're, they're really happy with it. And some of the idea, we can see it from some of the campaign in, in, their, in, 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 in their new projects, in their new campaign. And we also got our students winning the competition on their startup. And before uh, Terence, this, this guy is he's called Terence, uh, one of our star students. And before he graduated, he already started a shop trying to, to, to bring in the environmental idea. And, and that's why it get him the, the champion of these this competitions. And, and of course, apart from the student side, we also got the teachers, we have got the instructor, and we have got Ernest. Ernest, and he is one of the postdoc scholars from Stanford. And he's not just on the academic side, he's also on the, the real life market side. And one of the projects he's doing, it is the, the one we call it the unmanned store, and he's doing the, the research with DBS. And we also got the, the working with some of the, the, the government projects. No, actually not just government. Basically from these photos, obviously we have got our chief executive of Hong Kong, Carrie Lam, and then we have got our another instructor, Rachel Chen. And we are also working with the Hong Kong Design Center, promoting the creativity in Hong Kong. And we have got Eric and Edmund. And we have got the, the, 
the, the pioneer of design thinking, ideal, Tom Kelly. And obviously we have got the, the security for commerce and economic development. So basically we are in the market while you are, you are learning and we want to bring you up to the, 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 the standard or actually what you are doing in a school. It is actually prepare you is after your graduation, finishing the program, or actually while you are doing program, you can still have some meaningful projects. So that is all the slides. So I've got some, my, some information about my contact. And if you have got further information uh, or further questions, obviously you can actually first go to the AAL or FBE, or if you really want to get in touch with me, here, here are my contacts. So that's it for my part. And I've got my, one of my, my star students, Valencia, and she's, she can actually share a few words on how she, she see uh, our program, our EDI program, or because previously, as I said, the, the name is called BDI. So it's, it's a BDI program, shop the EDI program. Uh, Valencia? Yeah, thanks, Joseph. Hi, everyone, nice to meet you. It's very happy to see you guys with your passion, intelligence, and interest in our program. I'm Valencia from mainland China, and now I'm in my year four of our EDI program. I think Professor Joseph has already made a very comprehensive introduction, and I can add more details from a student perspective and answer your questions. So first, do you guys have any questions and I can answer you, or if you want to learn more about the program, I can introduce my own experience with you. So maybe Valencia, you can start with your sharing first, and then we let okay. them ask the question afterward. Okay, so for me, I think my best choice during the bachelor study is to become an EDI student. Because as an EDI student, your every shiny idea can come into practice. First, I learned the general business courses from the economics, finance, accounting, information system to marketing. This gave me a very solid foundation and a broad picture in business. Then I joined many advanced courses. For instance, in the business creativity and innovation class, the 90% students are the international students from all over the world. We gather together and to find the solutions for the Alibaba's cloud products with the and with the um, director from Alibaba company and to talk about how to win the cloud computing computation. And also we set up an online therapy company to help the teenagers with the mental problems in Hong Kong. And in our design studio and design thinking class, actually we do lots of things to have the real client, the one meets and the neighborhood live innovation. We have to uh, create new designs for the one Chai neighborhood with the citizens. And also we try to find a new product line to help with the need substitute. And those experiences give me a very fantastic, amazing. And it makes me to think about what I really want and what I want to achieve in the future. And now after graduation, I'm going to work in a largest nonprofit incubator in China. And in the future, I hope to work as a social entrepreneur to bring my own value to the society. And for the career part, I think mainly the students would choose four paths. The first path is about to become an entrepreneur. They would have their own projects to set up their own companies. And the fourth second path, they would choose to become a consultant for the best companies such as the McKinsey, Bain, or Boston Group. And the fourth third path, many students choose to become the business designer. They work in the IDU or other companies to try to make their ideas into practice. And the fourth path is many students in the long term, they become the CEO because what you learn from the BDI course is just what the CEO needs in the future. And those qualities are the creativity, design thinking mind, leadership, analytical capability, and the broad picture in the business and the world. So in summary, if you really like creativity and you really want to make a change for the world and to set up your own business, I think BDI or EDI program is the best choice for you. I and Professor Joseph, we are waiting for you at the University of Hong Kong. Thank you, Valencia. I think that is a wonderful sharing. Thank you. So uh, any questions you want to ask me or Valencia or our uh, uh, faculty colleague? It can be brewed to catch the opportunity. Yep. 
or because we have bombarded you with all the different information and then you still need time to digest it? <laughs> um, I have a question. Okay. Um, so does this course offer like any accreditation from CIMA, CIMA? Or like any other similar institutes like that give like accelerated path and clearing exams? And I, I think for this course, I, I don't think we have got those. But I, actually what I would say is, is that for the Hong Kong U program structure is that we encourage the students to do almost like a double major or say one major or plus, plus minor. And, and that is why the credit that you are going to do for EDI program it is going to occupy only almost like one third of your of your your, your total program required. So not on the BDI. So to answer your question quickly is that not on the BDI side or not on the EDI side. If you want to get those recognition, you possibly can use your remaining credit either through the the different major minor program or through the electives. Oh, okay. So if it's possible to do like a dual uh, course, is it possible to like um, do BBA with architecture? Uh, you can actually do the, the, as I say, double major, but depends on what is the other program. And if you are talking about architecture, because in, in this, my background, I'm an architect as, as well. And unfortunately, no, because the architecture program, basically they will eat up all the, your, your, your credits. You wouldn't have any spare credits to, to do other things. So I, I think architecture is one of the almost like exception that you couldn't do together with the, the EDI program or actually most of the, the, the major program. Okay, thank you, sir. All right, I've got a quick question. So I think okay. uh, Valencia mentioned that one of the things she did was 90% international students. Is there a higher ratio of international to um, local for this program compared to some of the other programs at HKU? I think to answer your, your question, I think I, I wouldn't say it is about the program. I think it is more about the different courses. Like the, I think maybe there are one or two courses that are more international program, so international students, but actually there are also other of our courses like the, the design thinking courses and or also the, the design studio or the, 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 uh, the, the, the venture and entrepreneurship management. I think we got it half half. And I think only some of the courses, maybe because the, the international students are more keen to, to learn more. And, and that is why we have got the higher percentage. But I, I think most of it is actually aligned with the, the Hong Kong U percentage. Okay, is there more? Because for that course, it is very famous for its international vision. And the lecturer, Ernest, actually he invites those international students. And most of them are exchange students to our classroom. So we can have the different perspectives and learn from each other because we have the different backgrounds. But for most the BDI and EDI program students, actually we don't have the exact percentage. Students can be from the international backgrounds or can be the local students. So it depends on your own passion talent is not based on your um, nationality. Yeah. yeah, correct. And I think the course that Valencia just mentioned and uh, the course by, by Ernest, it is one of the popular ones. They, mm -hmm. they open up two classes and two cohorts per semester, but I think both of them, they are they're all full. And, and so, so basically they are all packed. You can only say the international students that are so keen and that's why they, they eat up all the quotas. Yeah, because most BDI classes are so hot and popular for students and everyone want to enjoy in this program, so. <laughs> yep, I think that is the, the, the reason. Yeah. I see. Okay. Any other question? Uh, Ah, oh, really? yeah. So hello, uh, Winnie, are you having any questions or you just want to get some water? Okay, so maybe it is not a question. So any other questions 
you want to, to ask, we have got still a little bit of time before we go away. Um, I find a question from our student. It is, is there any other EDI students working in projects with other industries? Well, uh, I think yes, of course, because for the EDI students, uh, our program and the universities can provide lots of opportunities for you to work with the different industries. And many students double major in, for instance, the marketing, accounting, or even the biological science. So they would have participated in many programs with those industries. And for our course projects, actually, we would collab collaborate with the different industry every year and it depends on the course design. And for the future, actually, many EDI students not only to become their consultants, but also join the different industry job. For instance, some of them become the KOL or some become the athlete. So it mm. totally depends on your passion. Yeah. Yeah, to add on to what Valencia just talked about, and we have got our students work for Lockyer, and we have got some of our students work in the financial sector, work in the insurance, but not as the, the sales, but the insurance. Uh, the, 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 the structure development and also the innovation development. And so basic, even in, in the government. So basically the, any industry that you can name, we have got our graduates doing well over there. We have lots of resources. So if you are interested in one particular industry, you can then get our resources and join that industry's projects or internship. Yep. Okay, so I think that's it for, for us. And first of all, thank you, Valencia. And thanks for your time to do the sharing. I really appreciate, and I think that is a, a wonderful sharing with, from you. And also thank you for everyone's joining this section. So I guess I will hand it back to Nicole. Yes. Okay. Uh, thank a really big thank you to uh, Joseph for sharing and also Valencia, um, a very very fruitful sharing. So uh, now uh, uh, I'll uh, Joseph. Uh, I think you you can the meeting. Okay. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye.